It occurred to me after my original review video of the RCA HD 61 LPW42 that I still hadn't finished part two as originally planned. It happens to be that when one procrastinates long enough, one has the tendency to lose interest in things. But it's important to never underestimate the importance of following through. So with that, here's part two, the repair and troubleshooting video for the RCA DLP rear projection television set. Before we start, be aware that I'm not an electronics major or a TV repairman. I'm just sharing my experiences in order to help other mortals. So if you follow along, take the necessary precautions. Repairs don't always go as planned, and sometimes you'll need to be patient and actually learn stuff in order to get things done. At any rate, this is how you get inside. A bunch of Torx T20 screws hold the back cover on. Once that's off, all that's really left is this plastic trim piece surrounding the I.O. area. Just make sure you remember where all the screws go, and keep in mind that some of these are T10 in addition to the T20s. With that out of the way, all the boards are visible. The power supply, the DM2CR digital module, the audio video input output board, the audio processing board, and the formatter. To the right of the chassis area is the light engine area, which consists of the light engine and the lamp ballast. Now, as I learned the hard way during my repair experience, having an accurate diagnosis helps speed up the process immensely. So I'm just gonna talk through the startup routine here real quick for easy reference. Ready? Good. Immediately after the power key is tapped, the green light is going to come on solid, and then nothing is going to happen for probably a few seconds. After that, the sound will kick in, if there is any, then the unmistakable whine of the color wheel will be heard. At almost exactly this time, it'll attempt to light the lamp, and once it believes that the lamp has been lit successfully, the cooling fan will kick in a few seconds later. If you're running into problems getting the thing to actually boot up, Listen for what step it's getting hung up at, and diagnose accordingly. For example, you might think that you have a bad lamp, but if the wheel isn't working, it's not even going to get to that step. I can't stress enough how much time you'll save by slowing down and observing the startup routine, at least for troubleshooting startup issues. Don't forget to rig the lamp door cutoff when running this thing without the back cover on, and try not to look directly into the light given off by the lamp. Before I go any further, check the link in the video description for a copy of the service guide for this thing. It's actually reasonably well written and illustrated, so it's a great troubleshooting tool. Either way, with the set booted up, we can move on to image quality issues. Just like when troubleshooting the startup, it's very important to diagnose correctly before going through with a fruitless repair, as I learned the hard way, so let's take a look at a real-world example. In my case, everything actually ran fine, but there was a lot of ghosting and distortion to the picture, even on the menus and dialogues generated by the television. Now, the first step in troubleshooting was to determine where in the chain this problem was coming up. This model is very modular, so there's that many more reasons why eeny meeny miny mo won't be a very good troubleshooting strategy. In a nutshell, here's how it works. Video enters through one of the inputs. If that video is 480p or 1080i, it goes straight from the audio video I.O. board out to the formatter, then to the light engine. If the video is 480i, then it does the same thing except it takes a stop at the DM2CR digital module for a bit of preliminary scaling before it goes up to the formatter. In this case, since the symptom affected all video and menus, regardless of whether it was being touched by the DM2CR or not, I could eliminate it as a cause of the problem. While there is some circuitry on the I.O. board, there's not a lot of video processing that goes on there, so based on the fact that everything looked alright on here, this could also be bypassed. And since the problem didn't seem to affect audio, there wasn't much sense in even looking at that board. This left me with the power supply or the formatter board. Thankfully, I didn't have to guess. Walking up to the front panel and pressing menu and channel down at the same time pulls up this handy screen. 
After choosing service alignment, the menu disappears and is replaced with numbers in the corner of the screen. What we're looking for here is feature number 80, which can be accessed by pressing and holding or just tapping the volume up button until number 80 appears next to V on screen. Channel up will then cause the numbers to be replaced with these instructions. From here, it's just a matter of pressing the skip button on the remote to toggle the different patterns. What I found originally was that while external video was all messed up, these test patterns appeared to display just fine. This erroneously led me to believe that the formatter board was working properly and ultimately took me on a wild goose chase that led pretty much nowhere. All that these patterns really proved was that the light engine was 100% functional. So there was nothing to worry about there and that the formatter board was also partly functional. However, what I failed to realize at the time is that the formatter board is an analog to digital converter and that to process analog video adequately, it requires a very precise management of voltage. As it turns out, the cause of the problem was indeed bad capacitors on the formatter board and not the through hole capacitors either. Tiny surface mount modules that were extremely difficult to replace. And it didn't help that this problem is almost completely undocumented in all but a couple of places on the internet. At any rate, replacing these capacitors solved the problem. It didn't eliminate all of the ghosting, but I'd say that it probably got rid of a good 99% of it. So I'm happy. After fixing this, I also had the opportunity to experience another type of problem inside of the RCA DLP. What happened was, after replacing the lamp with a cheap Arabine brand knockoff from China, the center of the picture started getting dim. This happened very gradually, and while I originally thought it was due to there being just too much light coming in from outside, the problem persisted and got worse even after the sun set. Eventually, it degraded to a point where there was a massive egg-shaped blob in the middle of the screen, making it nearly impossible to see anything. This time, it wasn't the formatter board. Some quick research initially led me to believe that it might be a collapsed light tunnel that was causing this, but light tunnel problems don't look like that. A collapsed or collapsing light tunnel will manifest as uniform shadows on the edges of the screen, so I knew that there was some other kind of serious problem going on inside of the light engine. Further research led me to the conclusion that it had suffered from a burnt-up acrylic condenser lens, a phenomenon caused by the poor quality lamp, ironically in spite of its dim light output. I couldn't believe that this cheap lamp had ruined my television, so I got in contact with the lamp store and explained my findings, as well as the pictures I had taken inside of the light engine using my Canon video camera. I wasn't expecting much, but to my surprise, the store actually offered to pay for the repair. Luckily, there was some parts store out of Hawaii, of all places, that still had a new old stock light engine in a dusty corner of their warehouse. I told the lamp store that this would probably fix the problem, and to my amazement, they bought it and shipped it to me. I realize that there isn't much point to replacing the light engines in these things anymore, the lack of stock not even being the biggest reason, but there are some serviceable parts on them, so it can still be useful to know how to actually get the thing out. And this is thankfully not all that complicated of a process. In reality, it's possible to actually get to most of the stuff on the light engine with the light engine still attached to the television, but removing it is a simple affair of just loosening the screws, holding it to the set, and disconnecting the cabling. Remember, if you do loosen those screws, they're the only thing holding the whole engine in as it is completely suspended off of the floor of the set. If you just want to adjust an off-kilter image, all that needs to be done is to display a good test pattern and then loosen these screws slightly before slowly and carefully adjusting the tilt. For those with a bad light tunnel or if the light engine has a noisy or broken color wheel, those parts are fairly straightforward to replace. The ballast is not that difficult to swap out either, and as is typical with DLP technology, permanently white or black spots in the image that persist through the test patterns are usually indicative of a failed DMD chip. I can't stress this enough, accurate diagnosis is the key to a smooth repair operation. 
And that pretty much wraps up my experiences with repair and troubleshooting on these older RCA brand DLPs. From what I've read, these weren't their first digital rear projectors, but they were the company's first mass-produced ones that weren't astronomically expensive. The newer generation models are somewhat improved in that they accept 720p video and digital signals by employing a more straightforward design, so they're less susceptible to some of the annoying problems seen on these. Maybe they even moved on from using these labels for the wiring that turns into goop after 10 years. Who knows? At any rate, as I said in the original video, it was a phase that had to be gotten through in order to get to where we are today. So whether you're in the middle of an RCA DLP troubleshooting process of your own, or just viewing for the entertainment factor, you can be thankful that this type of analog nonsense was abolished in short order after this particular design. This is Browninggate signing off. Thanks for watching.